I will always keep my videos here free. The only thing that I ask from you is to like and subscribe to my page. And also check me out on Patreon. Thank you so much. In this video, we're going to be talking about the difference between direct and indirect techniques, passive and active motion, as well as how to choose different kinds of treatment plans for certain populations and the order that you should treat certain things. So first, we'll start with an overview of restrictive barriers. There's another video on what restrictive barriers are if you want to watch it. In general, all somatic dysfunctions have a restricted barrier. And restricted barriers will inhibit movement in one direction. The goal is to eliminate a restricted barrier. There are several different kinds of treatment in osteopathic medicine. They either fall into a direct or an indirect technique. Direct techniques are when you engage the restricted barrier. That means you move into the barrier and you move the tissues and joints into the direction of the restriction. For example, if we have T2, let's say you have a somatic dysfunction in which it is flex rotated left, side bent left. So I'll just write FRS left. A direct treatment in this case would mean you would go in the position that the body does not like to be in. Remember, we name these based on the position of ease. Therefore, the direction of the somatic dysfunction that it does not like to be in would be ERS right. And so treating a T2 FRS left, you would treat it ERS right. In other words, if something is flexed, rotated left and side bent left, you would want to treat it by extending, rotating right and side bending to the right. Another example, let's say you're using a myofascial technique. You have thoracic fascia that's restricted moving cephalad. A direct treatment is when you go into the restriction. And so you would go holding the tissue in a cephalad direction. Compare that to an indirect technique where you move the tissues and joints away from the restriction barrier. In this case, you go into the position of ease. In the same example, let's say you had T2 FRS left. In order to treat this, you would move T2 in a position of FRS left because that is the position of the most ease and an indirect treatment is when you go into a position of most ease. Another example, let's say the thoracic fascia is restricted in the same way moving cephalad. An indirect treatment is when you hold pressure or move the tissue in a caudad direction because that's the position of ease. That's the least restricted position. And that is called an indirect technique. There's also other terms called passive and active treatments. In active treatments, the patient assists during the treatment. So the patient actually moves during the treatment. In a passive treatment, the patient actually relaxes. And the way I remember this, it's always reference to what the patient is doing. If it's active, that means the patient is active. The patient is actually moving their muscles. If it's passive, that means the patient is passive. The patient is actually relaxing during the treatment. Let's go over some of the treatment types and hopefully this will become more clear to you. First, we'll talk about a very common technique called myofascial release. You should try to predict before I write these down whether these are going to be direct, indirect, as well as active or passive treatments. So in myofascial release, you can actually have both direct kinds or indirect kinds, depending on how you're doing the myofascial release. So in this case, it could be both. You can also have myofascial release that involves both active motion and passive motion. So again, you'll have both. For example, if you're treating a thoracic somatic dysfunction, if you have some fascial restriction and you're using a myofascial release treatment, a lot of it will be passive motion. The patient will be relaxed while you're doing that treatment. But then you also have some times where the patient adds some kind of enhancing technique. And so in that case, that would add an active motion. So it can have both active and passive motions. Then we have counter strain. So think about counter strain. Is that going to be a direct or an indirect technique? Well, counter strain is by definition, you're going away from the restriction. So that's going to be an indirect technique. Classically, this is also passive because the patient is relaxed while you're treating that patient. We also have facilitated positional release, which I'm going to do in the same color because in my mind, they're kind of similar. So I'm just going to write FPR for facilitated positional release. This is also similar to counter strain. It's indirect and it's passive. Another very common treatment type is muscle energy. Muscle energy classically is direct. I'm going to put a star by this because there are some rare times that you can use muscle energy indirectly. But for the purposes of what you should know, it typically is a direct technique. You have the patient actually using their muscles to help you with the technique of muscle energy. And so if you're considering if that's active or passive, if the patient is making any kind of motion, then that's an active technique. There's also HVLA, high velocity, low amplitude. A lot of people like this. This is one of my favorite kinds of techniques in OMM. If you think about it, HVLA is always going into the barrier. So it's a pretty dramatic kind of treatment and you're always going into the barrier. So this is a direct technique. 
because really you're trying to move through the barrier. However, the patient is not using their muscles. It's all the practitioner. It's all you treating that patient, and the patient is not using their muscles at all. So it's a passive kind of treatment. Then you have cranial. A cranial can also be used in both ways. You can have direct techniques or you can have indirect techniques, depending on what you're trying to treat, depending on how you think the patient is responding. So in this case, it's both. However, the patient really is never actively involved in terms of using their muscles, so we're going to write passive here. And then you have a couple of treatments that we don't think about as much, and that's the lymphatic treatments and the Chapman's reflexes. Both of these treatments are direct techniques because you're directly moving into restrictions. Both of these treatments are also passive because the patient is relaxing while you're treating that patient. Finally, we'll talk quickly about types of treatments that you should use in certain patients, frequencies, and kind of some general rules of thumb on the order that you should take in certain kinds of somatic dysfunctions. These aren't really set in stone. These are just kind of some rough guidelines. So, you know, you shouldn't take this as a law. But in general, these are some kind of rules of thumb to go by. For types of treatment, for elderly patients or hospitalized patients or people who are typically more at risk, they should receive more indirect or a gentle direct technique. That's kind of common sense. You want to do something that's less risky for that patient. If someone has osteoporosis or metastatic cancer, for example, you want to avoid something like HVLA. You don't want to break anybody's bone. Same thing if you have a strain, neck strain, or neck sprain, you want to avoid a direct technique like HVLA. You should do something that's more indirect to avoid, you know, hurting that patient. You have to do no harm to that patient. For higher risk patients, you shouldn't use too much OMT. You should limit the OMT so that they have time to recover. Pediatric patients might benefit or might be able to receive more frequent treatments, but someone who's elderly should have less frequent treatments so that they can have time to recover. Acute cases, if they're responding to treatment, you can have shorter intervals between the treatments. Because if they're responding and it's acute, it might benefit them to have a shorter interval. Now some general rules of thumb, for order or sequence of treatment. If you have someone with psoas syndrome, you should treat lumbar spine or thoracolumbar spine first. If you have someone with a cervical spine, somatic dysfunction, or even both, maybe cervical spine and thoracic spine and ribs, you should typically treat the ribs or the upper thoracic spine before you treat the cervical spine. And if you think about that, it's because you want to really isolate the somatic dysfunction. It could be that the cervical spine, for example, is having somatic dysfunction. It might be interacting with the thoracic spine. You know, in osteopathic medicine, we believe that the entire body interacts with each other. So in this case, you want to treat the ribs, upper thoracic spine, before the cervical spine. Similarly, you want to treat the thoracic spine before you treat rib dysfunctions. It could be that the rib dysfunction gets treated by treating the thoracic spine first, but you want to treat the thoracic spine first in general before you treat ribs. In cranial treatment, sometimes cranial treatment might help to relax the patient so that you can allow OMT to benefit in other areas. Honestly, I don't think that's very high yield, but something to know. If you have something in the extremities, some kind of dysfunction in the extremities, you should treat the spine first, the sacrum, and the ribs. Basically, you want to treat the axial skeleton before you treat the extremities. Like I said, this part is not very high yield, I would say, but general principles that might be high yield from here is that if it's a higher risk patient, you wanna avoid direct treatments, you wanna do something indirect, you wanna give them more time to relax. If someone has, for example, osteoporosis, you're not gonna do HVLA because you might cause a fracture. So a lot of these are common sense questions. Some of them might require some thinking like treating the ribs or upper thoracic spine before cervical or thoracic spine before treating the ribs or treating the axial skeleton before you treat extremities.